Hello, everyone. Um, the title of this talk is going to be Imaging and Genomics in Neurodegenerative Diseases, Alzheimer's Disease, Parkinson's Disease, and Traumatic Brain Injury. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how imaging of the brain is used to diagnose and understand some of these diseases, and also the role of genetics in uh, promoting risk uh, for some of these brain disorders or exacerbating outcomes. So I'll just begin with an example from Alzheimer's disease. We know that um, in late life, um, there's a great risk for developing uh, symptoms of memory loss. And in the case of Alzheimer's disease, this is associated with a buildup of plaques in the brain, amyloid plaques, and also neurofibrillary tangles, uh, which disrupt the function of brain cells, um, disrupt the communications between them, and also cause cell loss that you can see on a brain scan. So this is an example A here. Uh, where a standard MRI of the brain has been classified into gray and white matter. And you can basically see uh, the amounts of gray and white matter tissue uh, color-coded here. And if you were to compare point by point on the surface of the brain, uh, the amount of gray matter between a group of people with Alzheimer's disease and a group of people who are healthy uh, and elderly, uh, you'll see that the Alzheimer's group would have maybe 10 to 15 percent reduction in the amount of gray matter in some key regions. And these seem to correspond with the regions uh, that are most greatly affected by amyloid. And you can use MRI as a measure or a metric of how much tissue is lost. Now, one of the other things that you can do is if you collect uh, MRI over time from a group of people with Alzheimer's disease, is you can compare the amount of gray matter lost in the patient group uh, with healthy people um, over a period of time. And this animation shows that uh, as the disease progresses, a group of people with Alzheimer's disease had uh, progressively lower and lower tissue in the memory systems of the brain, uh, losses moving forward into the emotional limbic uh, systems of the brain, and the areas in blue are comparatively protected. These are areas where um, Alzheimer's patients tend not to lose as much brain tissue, uh, areas of uh, sensory motor function that are not so badly affected in the disease. So one thing we can do with MRI data from a particular patient is we can measure how much tissue is lost uh, between the first scan and the second. And this could give you an indication of whether a treatment is working or whether or not the progression of the disease is similar to other patients uh, who have a similar disorder. So what we've done here is we've used a method called tensor-based morphometry that essentially takes the baseline scan and stretches or compresses it onto a scan taken from the same person later. And in color, you see that it's telling us that certain areas of the brain, the temporal lobe, the memory system, have lost about uh, 30 to 40 percent of their tissue between the first scan and the second. Uh, there's a big red area in the center in the lateral ventricles, uh, a fluid-filled space which is expanded by about uh, 60 uh, to 80 percent. And obviously, this method could be used to map uh, the amount of change that has been over a period of time for purposes of monitoring. If you combine this data from a large number of people, um, in this case from a group of just over 100 people with Alzheimer's disease, and compare um, similar rates of lost data from healthy people who are just elderly but have no symptoms of cognitive decline, you can make a map um, from that aggregated data that says which parts of the brain are losing tissue the fastest. And you'll see that on average, uh, in this group of Alzheimer's patients, the temporal lobes, the areas that are involved in uh, learning and memory, um, are losing brain tissue at about 3 or 4% per year. Uh, some areas of the brain are losing tissue, but not as fast. And then again, these fluid-filled areas in the center of the brain, the ventricles, are expanding at a rate of about 2 to 3% per year. And this is sort of a profile of atrophy or brain change that you could map in an individual patient or, as we see here, in a group. Now, if we look at mild cognitive impairment, uh, which is a condition which is intermediate uh, between healthy aging and Alzheimer's disease, you can see that you can also average up the rate of tissue loss for different parts of the brain. And in this group of people with MCI, 254 of them, when they're compared with the um, rates of loss of brain tissue in, in healthy elderly people, you'll see that they have uh, sped up rates of tissue loss by about uh, 1% per year. So again, this is not as fast a loss of brain tissue as in Alzheimer's disease, but significantly faster uh, than healthy elderly people of the same age and gender. And the map on the right there shows you the significance, the, the statistical significance of the differences between the MCI group and the healthy people. And you'll see the major differences in their uh, rate of aging is in these temporal lobes, the area that uh, is, is very much involved in learning and memory, and that fits with the symptoms of the disease. Now let's look at this again from a different point of view. In Alzheimer's disease, this is um, a sagittal image of the temporal lobes. Uh, the areas with the greatest loss um, are obviously temporal. Uh, again, the learning and memory systems. 
little bit um, uh, of accelerated loss in the frontal lobes, the areas involved in, in executive function, uh, certainly a behavioral domain where symptoms begin in uh, uh, medium to late stage Alzheimer's disease. But some areas of the brain are really not significantly losing tissue uh, any more quickly than uh, healthy controls, and these are the ones that are not highlighted uh, on the image on the right. Again, MCI, again, is an intermediate stage between uh, Alzheimer's disease and, and healthy aging. Milder tissue loss. Um, these patients are very often the focus of clinical trials uh, to uh, assess um, medications and compounds or any other intervention that may uh, slow the rate of tissue loss. So, again, these imaging metrics are quite useful in that context to see if the intervention or any other factor has affected the loss of brain tissue. And then just finally, if you took a coronal cut through the brain uh, here just below the level of the eyes, you'll also see the, the sort of preferential loss of tissue in Alzheimer's disease uh, in these temporal lobe systems. Um, again, very prominent expansion of fluid fill spaces. And if you, again, look in MCI, maybe about uh, half the rate of brain atrophy as you would see in an Alzheimer's patient, uh, but at least different from healthy controls. Now, one of the things that you can do with imaging when it's collected over time is compute measures of brain tissue loss for different groups of people and compare them across different parts of the brain. So here we've looked at the frontal lobe and the occipital lobe and the parietal and temporal lobes in people who are healthy, the controls, uh, people with mild cognitive impairment uh, who are not declining, who we're calling stable. Then in people who have MCI but also converted uh, to having Alzheimer's disease within a period of a year or so. And then finally in red here, people with Alzheimer's disease. And one of the things that you'll notice is that um, universally every part of the brain is losing tissue faster uh, in Alzheimer's disease versus the other groups. Um, it certainly looks like there's a loss of around 2 to 3% per year in most regions of the brain. But then you'll notice that in healthy people, uh, it's much slower, uh, maybe about half a percent per year, um, or um, certainly less than 1%. And then these groups of people with MCI differ a great deal. Uh, the people who are stable um, tend to resemble controls, maybe losing less than 1% of their brain tissue uh, per year. But the people with MCI who uh, eventually convert to having Alzheimer's disease within a year tend to have a much faster rate of brain tissue loss. And that uh, gives us an indication that these uh, follow-up MRIs are quite useful in understanding whether a patient is going to stay stable or whether they'll eventually have symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, at least in the imminent future. So one interest in uh, clinical neurology is whether or not the rates of brain tissue loss are linked uh, with symptoms that the patients are having. And uh, I won't go into the details of this analysis. It's in the paper down at the bottom. Um, but we had found that, in fact, the uh, amount of the brain that shows significant loss um, in, in these particular maps I've shown you is also very highly correlated with um, behavioral and neuro neuropsych symptoms uh, that the patients are having. Uh, most prominently, depression, uh, loss of brain tissue, uh, when it's accelerated, tends to be uh, associated with uh, uh, greater depressive symptoms in patients. Um, also, um, poorer performance on uh, tests involving immediate recall, um, logical memory, for example. Um, and also, there tends to be an association uh, with global cognitive function, uh, measures of overall um, uh, behavioral uh, performance and uh, general knowledge uh, linked with a rate of tissue loss on these scans. It's also interesting to ask, is there any blood marker, um, in other words, proteins or compounds in the blood that you could see on a blood test, uh, that relate to how fast you're losing brain tissue, uh, and there are. So if you have elevated levels of um, Alzheimer proteins in the blood, uh, beta amyloid, for example, or uh, tau, which is another uh, uh, pathologic marker of Alzheimer's disease, you also tend to have faster brain tissue. And so you can imagine using brain imaging to try and fish out of blood tests markers of imminent decline, and there's a great deal of work going on connecting genetics and proteomics and other measures that you can uh, collect from blood or saliva, for example, uh, with brain changes either now or in the future uh, on serial brain scans that have been collected. So just moving on, um, which markers of brain tissue loss are useful uh, in a drug trial? Well, uh, one of them that's been a major focus of research has been uh, quantification of the rate of tissue loss in the hippocampus. So this is a fairly small structure um, that's in deep in the temporal lobes of the brain, but you can measure it automatically. And certainly if you compare um, the rates of hippocampal tissue loss um, between Alzheimer's patients and people with MCI and people who are 
uh, elderly but uh, healthy, um, you'll see big differences. And here we just find that uh, you know, between six, uh, five and six percent of hippocampal tissue is lost per year. If you have Alzheimer's disease, that's on average. Um, whereas the MCI and healthy groups uh, have much lower rates of hippocampal tissue loss. And the, these are obviously useful as metrics of decline in the brain uh, that correlate with symptoms of the disease. Now, you can also ask some uh, interesting questions about genetics. Is there anything in your DNA or genetic makeup or anything else uh, in your lifestyle that affects how quickly your brain loses tissue? And so you may have MCI or you may be healthy or you may have Alzheimer's disease. And um, it's important to know whether there are things that you can do or things in your DNA that are affecting how quickly your brain uh, is losing tissue. Now, in this rather complex graph, um, we've broken down um, groups of people by the um, genotype for a gene that uh, increases your risk for Alzheimer's disease by a factor of three. And you can, in fact, have two copies of this bad Alzheimer's gene. It's fairly prevalent to have one copy. About a quarter of us have one copy. About 4% of us have two copies. Uh, the gene is called ApoE4. Um, it's short for apolipoprotein E4. And this is the major um, genetic risk locus uh, for Alzheimer's disease. And you can see it has quite a devastating uh, effect, uh, not just on our risk of disease, but also the rate at which our brains are losing tissue. In many of these categories, not just healthy controls, but also MCI, you'll see that the rate of brain tissue loss is maybe 2 or even 3% more, more uh, rapid in people that carry the APOE4 genotype. So this has led um, a lot of pharmaceutical companies to be interested in uh, either selectively enrolling people with this risk gene, uh, because they will be able to see uh, if their medications are effective in slowing this very rapid rate of atrophy, uh, or doing separate analyses in people that carry this gene versus those who don't, because their brains tend to atrophy in very different uh, uh, profiles and rates. Now, I mentioned APOE is one of the um, risk factors for Alzheimer's disease that promotes uh, brain tissue loss, but are there any others? And one of the uh, projects that we've um, uh, developed is a project of the Enigma Consortium, is to screen uh, measures taken in brain scans and also screen people's DNA and try and decide whether there are any uh, variations in our DNA that affect how quickly the brain loses tissue, how much brain tissue there is, um, moving on to other types of imaging, the, the uh, diffusion scans that look at brain connectivity, um, are there any genes that affect the connections or the networks of the brain. And this is something that's been done uh, for some time in psychiatry. Um, it's been possible to compare patients' DNA with uh, healthy people's DNA and pinpoint uh, genetic differences. But the interest in, in screening uh, brain scans uh, for genetic effects um, is also there. Um, it's been thought that maybe genetic variations affect brain measures more directly uh, than they affect diagnosis because uh, you're looking at tissues directly. Um, it would be very useful if you could find um, you know, aspects of brain scans that were linked to genetic variation uh, to try and understand, uh, in some cases, how you could prevent uh, the genetic differences from causing brain tissue loss. And th this has led to a sort of endophenotype or biomarker hypothesis that rather than sort of uh, simply looking at uh, correlations between DNA and, and symptoms or diagnosis, we should really drill down into the images or other uh, uh, metrics of, of, of disease and see what those links are and see if we can make them more precise. Now, one way analytically you can find out whether a genetic variant uh, links to a brain measure is uh, to just march through the genome, look at these common variants, and basically do statistical analysis of whether people uh, who are different, uh, they might have a certain disease or different brain measures, um, have any identifiable uh, associated variation in that area of the genome. And you could do this as a regression. You could uh, plot the number of alleles or the number of um, you know, genetic differences in a certain location uh, that a person has, uh, 0, 1, or 2 copies of, for example, the A uh, version in, in this gene. And you can see if it uh, associates with the volume of the brain or some other measure of brain function. And so if, for example, there was a, a genetic variant that gave you a big blue head, um, you could measure people with uh, big blue heads. I'm using a silly example, obviously, here. And uh, eventually you might find a place in the genome where there was a, a, a causal uh, or apparently causal uh, gene that might be involved in this, uh, in this trait. So moving on a little bit more, um, rather than just look at one gene, um, a candidate gene approach where you have a good idea of what the gene might be, you can also search uh, the, the whole genome. And in fact, uh, you can screen about half a million or up to two million uh, common variants all at once. 
uh, to see if any of them uh, predict either a disease or a, a trait in the brain. And this is a Manhattan plot that I'm showing you here on the right, where the evidence uh, that each one of these genetic variants is associated with um, a trait, it could be a disease or a brain measure, uh, is plotted. Uh, we've plotted the negative logarithm of the p-value or the st statistical significance value of the association. And the idea here is that the more evidence that there is that the uh, genetic variant is associated with a measure we care about, uh, the higher uh, the point is at that position along the genome. And also the, these um, uh, areas of the genome are organized into chromosomes. And so the one on the left there, that's chromosome one. Uh, the one in, in dark blue next to it is chromosome two all the way along through all of the chromosomes. And so you can begin to ask, are there any variants that we can uh, see that are quite common that are associated with a measure uh, that we care about? And th this is called a genome-wide association study because uh, we're looking at associations with uh, traits such as disease or a brain measure, and we're looking genome-wide rather than just picking a candidate ahead of time that we think may be implicated. So this has been uh, quite successful. Um, if you compare the DNA of people with schizophrenia, uh, to people who don't have schizophrenia. Um, you can do a genome-wide scan. In fact, uh, the Psychiatric uh, Genomics Consortium has been doing this for some time. So just talking about um, the growth of genome-wide screening over time, uh, it's an interesting story. Um, as the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium collected more and more data from more and more patients and controls, the significance or level of evidence for areas of the genome uh, as being implicated in uh, schizophrenia risk grew. And uh, as you can see here, you know, starting in uh, 2009 uh, with uh, uh, 7,000 individuals, these genome-wide screens have grown to uh, you know, tens of thousands of patients. And you can begin to see new leads uh, as to parts of the genome, uh, some of them well understood relating to immunity, uh, others not well understood that need to be looked at uh, much further that may have a bearing on uh, your risk for mental illness. Now, if you do this in uh, Alzheimer's disease, I mentioned earlier that uh, um, there is an area of the genome, the APOE region, that uh, a common variant uh, that about a quarter of us have uh, ups your risk of Alzheimer's disease by about a uh, factor of three. Um, if you're unfortunate enough to have two copies of the APOE4 uh, gene, you, your risk can be increased by as much as 15 times. But also, there are other uh, genetic variants that um, affect your risk for Alzheimer's disease by about 10 to 20 percent. And in 2009, um, three more of these were discovered. Uh, since then, even more of them have been discovered. Um, some of them are shown here, the clue, PICARM, and CR1. Uh, these are genes in which there are common variants that uh, healthy people uh, have. Um, they do alter your risk, uh, again, for Alzheimer's disease by about 10 to 20 percent. Uh, not as much as APOE, but um, it's quite interesting to, to see that uh, about 6% of our Alzheimer's risk comes from APOE. It depends on the genotype that you have in that gene. Another 2% of our risk for Alzheimer's disease comes from the 19 or so other risk loci that have been discovered. Um, but we do know that uh, a third of our risk for Alzheimer's is genetic. Uh, not only that, it can be explained uh, even by these common variants. And so common variants are not the only type of variation in the genome. There are uh, deletions and insertions and copy number variants and other types of genetic change. But uh, we know that uh, through a, a novel kind of analysis called GCTA, uh, which tries to uh, understand how much of the risk for an illness uh, is explainable by common variants, we know that a third of the risk for Alzheimer's disease comes from these common variants. So um, there is an ongoing effort uh, to increase the samples for these genome-wide screens uh, to try and dig out uh, what might account for uh, the 25% of still hidden uh, genetic risk uh, that is harbored in our genome. Now, one of the things that we've been able to do with our consortium Enigma, um, and this is work in partnership with another consortium called CHARGE, is try and understand how these risk genes affect the brain. So not just um, uh, you know, the, the gene increases your risk for illness, but uh, you know, why that might be. Is there anything identifiable in the brain that the gene relates to, uh, maybe tissue loss or, or systems integrity, uh, the integrity of systems that are implicated in the illness? So in this study, um, we, this is a study by, by the Enigma Consortium with CHARGE, um, we found that there are a whole range of variants in the APOE gene that um, common variation in, 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 in those areas is linked with the size of your hippocampus. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the hippocampus is part of the brain involved in learning and memory. Uh, people with Alzheimer's lose tissue there much faster. And so this is really quite an interesting discovery that there are really parts of the genome that 
affect how big your hippocampus is. Um, the plot uh, B there on the right shows that uh, in uh, groups of people that are younger, um, these APOE risk loci don't affect the size of your hippocampus by very much. But by the time your age uh, you know, gets into your 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, there really is quite a big difference between the hippocampal size, uh, the size of this learning and memory system, and carriers of the APOE gene versus people, I'm sorry, the, the APOE4 variant of the gene, versus people that have the safe or less risky form of the gene. So th this is sort of a use of imaging uh, to try and understand why it might be that this gene uh, confers risk. Um, one reason may be that uh, it, it uh, promotes the um, loss of tissue, and you can even drill further into the genome to see which parts of our genetic makeup are influential uh, for that. Now, you can also look through imaging databases and say, well, now that you've found some Alzheimer's risk genes, for example, this, uh, this one in Clue or Clusterin, um, can you compare the brains of people that carry the bad versus the good version of the gene and see what differences there are? And th this study by Meredith Brasky and others, uh, published in the Journal of Neuroscience, um, looked at diffusion scans that look at the integrity of the white matter in the brain and found that people that carry the Alzheimer-conferring variant in the clustering gene um, have apparently different white matter structure. Um, even when they're young and healthy, even 50 years before the disease typically hits, and um, this is really quite interesting. Uh, it, it, it shows that there are signs uh, of Alzheimer's risk genes in the brain um, you know, a full five decades before the disease is, is typically diagnosed. And so there's a great deal of interest in trying to understand what is structurally different in the brains and whether uh, they, they appear even earlier than young adulthood or whether they're preventable. So moving on, this genome-wide screening approach is also being used in Parkinson's disease. Um, you can see a large number of genes that are implicated in risk uh, for Parkinson's disease. Um, one of them, very interesting, SNCA, is involved in uh, synaptic vesicle and dopamine release, which is uh, certainly related to um, the known mechanism uh, for motor rigidity uh, and tremor in, in Parkinson's disease. Um, this, again, is a genome-wide screen that's been uh, increasing in size for some time. There are 24 known Parkinson's disease risk loci. Um, and if you compute a genetic risk score based on these, um, the score itself based on your genome um, will account for um, you know, a threefold difference in risk between the people with the highest risk score and the people with the lowest risk score, the top quintile and the, the lowest quintile or 25% uh, of scores for that uh, genetic test. So there is an interesting way that imaging can help understand these associations between genetics and disease. You can essentially try and understand how the gene's effect on disease um, is brought about by looking at brain scans and seeing if there's anything there uh, that gives an explanation. So one such study is Enigma. Uh, Enigma is a consortium, a um, large number of people worldwide, over 300 uh, scientists from 185 institutions looking at genetic variants that are associated with measures of the brain in over 30,000 brain scans. So one of the recent studies published in Nature um, looked at uh, common genetic variants that are statistically associated with the size of different parts of the brain. And you can see different subcortical regions of the brain highlighted here and regions of the genome where common variation is linked with the size of those parts of the brain. Now, one thing that's interesting to look at is whether the genes that uh, have variation linked with brain differences are the same ones, or in some cases, some of the same ones as the genes that promote disease. So in this example, um, we looked at genes that are promoting risk for Parkinson's disease and asked the question, are they among the ones that appear to be affecting uh, the volume or size of parts of the brain? And, and they are. So one region of the brain, the putamen, which is implicated in the symptoms of Parkinson's, um, appears to have genetic variation uh, linked with it that also promotes risk for Parkinson's disease. Um, and th this type of test compares the results of two genome-wide screens and tests whether the top hits or the most significant uh, genes in one uh, are randomly distributed in the other or whether or not they occur as more significant uh, than, than average in the second one. And this, this helps provide a link between um, brain variation, uh, genetics, and symptoms of disease. Also, there are um, uh, brain disorders that um, you wouldn't think would have any relationship to genetics, but they do. So in traumatic brain injury, for example, um, this is um, something that's very common 
Um, you know, someone may have an injury uh, to, to the head or brain that causes uh, brain trauma. Uh, here's a TBI uh, patient, uh, their standard anatomical image, and also a reconstructed fiber map uh, from diffusion weighted imaging. And one of the questions is whether your genotype or your genetic makeup affects uh, how you do. And interestingly, it may do. So the people that carry the uh, bad or disease-conferring form of the APOE4, of the APOE risk gene, uh, the one that's associated with Alzheimer's disease, they also seem to have poorer outcomes in traumatic brain injury. In other words, uh, given the same uh, injury, I mean, certainly in, in children that carry APOE4, uh, they tend to do worse. Um, also, in adults, there seems to be some evidence for this, but it seems to also differ uh, by ethnicity. Now, beyond APOE4, there's been a lot of interest in other candidate genes, uh, COMT or neuroglobin or interleukin or some of the growth factor uh, genes that you see there, MTHFR is a folate-related gene, uh, whether or not um, DNA variation in these, these genes affects uh, outcomes in brain trauma or even treatment response. So that's a, a new area of uh, uh, genomics uh, in relation to brain trauma. So just to summarize this talk, um, we reviewed how imaging and genetics can be used uh, to study a number of different degenerative diseases. Uh, in Alzheimer's, MRI is widely used to chart the progression of the illness. Uh, there is a sequence that starts in the memory systems typically and spreads to the more emotional and executive uh, regions of the brain. Um, the rate of tissue loss tends to be faster uh, by about 2 or 3% per year in people that carry the APOE4 um, Alzheimer risk gene. A quarter of a, about a quarter of us do carry that uh, that gene. And some drug trials prefer to over-enroll uh, people with Alzheimer's genes uh, because they know that they'll decline faster. And so some of the uh, work of geneticists is defining uh, polygenic risk scores or scores based on a number of different genes, uh, possibly TREM2, which is a, another gene associated with faster brain loss, um, to try and identify groups of people who will decline faster in terms of brain uh, uh, and also clinical uh, function. Imaging is also useful to help understand uh, some of the uh, genes that are uh, implicated in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And Enigma is one imaging consortium that's trying to screen the genome uh, for factors that affect the brain. Um, the effect of the APOE gene on the hippocampal volume looks like it's age-dependent uh, and involves many SNPs, not just the two that are classically tested uh, in the test uh, of the APOE gene. Um, some risk genes for Alzheimer's, uh, one of them clusterin, uh, may affect some brain measures, for example, diffusion imaging, about 50 years before the disease hits. It's interesting to try and understand what the mechanism of the disease is based on these genes that work real in life. Um, and also in Parkinson's disease, some of the uh, risk genes are starting to be understood as possibly affecting the basal ganglia. Uh, Enigma has, has found this, um, and that can give us new leads as to what the systems might be uh, that are targeted by these genetic variations. And we also have to bear in mind, just to summarize, that genetics may affect outcomes in clinical neurology, even if the illness is not genetic. And so certainly brain trauma um, is an accident, uh, it's not related to your genome, um, but your uh, genetic makeup may affect whether or not you recover, uh, how quickly and which treatments uh, are effective. And so obviously this is an area where uh, as new data comes in, it's, it's useful, but meta-analyses uh, such as Enigma are very valuable in deciding whether or not these associations are true. So thank you very much.